So then preparations are underway for the fourth South Africa Investment Conference to be held on the 24th of this month. The conference is part of government's investment drive meant to attract about 1.2 trillion rand worth of investments over a five-year period. This year, the focus will be unlocking investment for growth as well as job creation. It comes as the country emerges from the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. For more on this, let's speak with Trudy Makaya, the Special Economic Advisor to the Presidency. A very good evening to you, ma'am. Welcome to the program. I suppose to say that we have a steep economic climb ahead of us would perhaps be the understatement of the year. It's not an understatement. Um, I think we, we come from very difficult economic conditions um, wrought by the pandemic and also civil unrest. We were seeing some recovery in the first half um, of 2020, but it wasn't as strong in the second half. And so we really need to redouble our efforts uh, in terms of getting back on track. Um, we now have also the geopolitical situation, which might create um, some problems for, for our trade performance. Uh, but um, so, yes, we, we have um, risks that we have to look at. But we also have um, a lot going internally in terms of the drivers of economic growth. Uh, if we look at what we're trying to do with the investment conference, encouraging domestic investments, encouraging localization. So I think we, we have to focus on the domestic growth engine while we also um, take international opportunities and manage those risks. And only 45%, I mean, I beg your pardon, from the latest update, only 45 projects from 152 previous investment announcements have actually been completed. 57 are under construction. Is that fast enough as far as pace is concerned, especially in a country that's dealing with a joblessness emergency? Um, yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's on track. Um, if we look at some, a lot of the investments that had been um, committed to, some were multi-year commitments. Um, it obviously also takes time to commission plant um, then there was a slowdown um, for some of the projects, not all. Some of the projects slowed down construction during the pandemic. So I think it's, it's still on track. Of course, we would have liked to see um, a bit more um, coming on board because then it gives us certainty. But I think um, at the level that, that we are, it's comfortable. And I'd like to talk to you about the issue of pledges because often at these investment summits, you come out as the government with pledges, right? That's what government gets. But what, how strict is the, 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 I don't want to say legislation, but the commitment to those pledges, what obligation, what is the extent of obligation on the companies that make those obligations? Can they pull out as and when they wish to? So, you know, you think, you think about it as a two-way relationship. Um, government pledges to um, create a conducive policy environment to lower transaction costs in the economy, and business then um, commits to make investments. Now, in, in terms of encouraging investment, um, it's, not, it's not a stick. Uh, it's more of a carrot. And so what we do is just try to satisfy ourselves that the projects that are being um, committed to have gone through the right approvals within those companies. Um, they've got board approval where, where, where um, that's appropriate. Um, they've gone through um, the right approval processes so that we have some confidence that there's a real willingness for them to do so. But we have seen, for instance, that about 15 projects have come um, under strain or some have uh, been halted. So a lot will still depend on market conditions. Yeah. Uh, companies could change their mind, have other options. Um, on our side, all we do is just to encourage them to invest as, as much as they can. And how do you encourage them, given the current situation in South Africa, where we've got the energy crisis that's been persistent now for well over 10 years. You've got the various issues to do with labor that says you need to pay workers more in this country. It's not good enough to just say, here's a job, but the money needs to be an adequate living wage and the rest of it. Yeah, so I think it's important um, that workers um, get a fair wage. We do see um, the challenges uh, when, when workers live in poverty. Um, so what, what government does, um, A, is to ensure that um, it unlocks any blockages um, to investment, any inefficiencies, and also creates a conducive environment. So you talk about energy, for instance, um, and we've had um, a program where we, we have renewable energy projects um, come into, um, into the energy mix. But there was a time when there was a low and there was a lack of clarity 
in terms of where that policy direction is going. So that's where the role of government really becomes crucial to provide clarity, um, to promulgate um, regulation um, that supports uh, uh, investment. Um, there were the moves, for instance, in terms of self-generation to first increase um, the threshold to one megawatt so that if you are creating, you're creating a plant, and that you don't have to get a license. And now that has been raised to 100 megawatts. Mm. So those kinds of actions then bring in more investment. So I think it's enabling, um, reading the market and seeing what is the responsible thing to do in terms of unleashing investment. And also, of course, dealing with some of the headaches um, like local service delivery that we often find. Um, so in certain districts, we find that there's challenges and you know companies don't want to invest there or they threaten to leave where they're there. And so institutions like Invest SA would go in and try to sort out those problems, work with the rest of government to ensure that those barriers are alleviated. Mm. And when Minister Patel gave a briefing on this upcoming conference, I think it was on Monday, um, just scanning through social media reaction, a lot of people were saying, oh my goodness, not another investment conference. We're not seeing the difference in our immediate communities. How many people are actually in jobs currently as a result of the previous summits which have been held on the same issue? Sure. So I can't give you an aggregate figure, but I can give um, examples um, where we've zoomed in um, um, to, to, to really look at the impact. Um, so, for instance, if we look at some of the investments um, that were made uh, by Mercedes-Benz, where they pledged $10 billion, uh, at the 2018 conference, and then they increased that um, to $3 billion, uh, later. Uh, and we find that that created about 600 new jobs um, and a further 2,000 in the value chain. Because what they also did, um, that unlocked also um, um, investments in component plants uh, in the area, uh, which then uh, feeds into that investment. So you have that value chain um, mm. effect. Um, if we look um, at the investment um, that was made by Procter and Gamble, you know, a product like sanitary pads, Pampers, that we didn't produce, uh, lines that we didn't produce in the country, um, they created those production lines, and that facility created 19 new jobs. So we're going through it um, as the numbers come in to try and figure out how many jobs are created. Into foods uh, was another example of a uh, fresh food processing plant at OR Tambo International, uh, which created 600 new jobs. Mm. So we try to track um, the job creation. Some of it, um, you know, of course, uh, rises over time as the plant will get commissioned, as the, as the uh, product matures. Uh, but what, you know, we, we also try to ensure that we go back um, to the companies where there are any difficulties um, so that our numbers are clear and, and we acknowledge uh, investments which are no longer proceeding. So as I said, I think the pace um, is comfortable. We would have loved to see more. I think the slowdown created by the pandemic has been unfortunate um, in that if we look to the 2030 target, you know, we're supposed to be having 30% of, of GDP in investment. Um, we're still far from that, but we're certainly uh, working towards that. And, and as you say, we also, sure. These are jobs being created. I was listening to the numbers you were just mentioning. A drop in the ocean for a country that has an unemployment rate of about 35%, even larger if you break it down into different categories. And I don't know if you'd agree, what we need most now are lasting jobs, permanent employment, so that the people who are working currently don't then go back and become part of those statistics. So these are the kinds of quality jobs um, that you would want, and which is why we're encouraging um, the, 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 the creation of even more. Uh, you know, when a company commits a plant, um, it can't suddenly pull out um, as easily as if it just invests um, in, in um, uh, financial instruments. So that's why we, we try to emphasize that direct investment. Similarly, for local investment, trying to keep as much um, in South Africa as possible and encouraging those companies to invest will lead to job creation. Having said that, I think government also recognizes that in the short term, there's got to be opportunities that are created through public programs. But, you know, Tamigila, those are the, the kinds of jobs you would say are not long term um, and not the same quality as those that would come from investments. But certainly there's a recognition that in the short term, we've got to have public uh, 
uh, programs that create jobs, hence the presidential employment stimulus, which created over 600,000 jobs um, over the course um, of the year. Now, mm -hmm. that is scale that was fast, but of course, those are short-term opportunities while we work on the investment and the growth story. Thank you very much for that, Tudi Makanya, uh, economic advisor to the presidency. Grateful for your time tonight. Let's remind